Everybody wait, and they hold on. hold on, hold on, wait, give me one second. Top of the morning, right? Um, you realize that this video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, where you could gain bonus access to Nebula by signing up for Curiosity Stream with the link in the description right now. What you doing? Anyway, um, carry on. Everybody and they bald head Grammy tell me not to do this today. But I could do it anyway. If we talking about actually combating the skullduggery that is afoot in these James Bond films, we gotta do this. Just a foreign man in a foreign land. Man, man. I can make it work anywhere I can. Man, man. Even though the past for the American. Man, man. I know what I is, I know what I am. Man, man. Just a foreign man in a foreign land. Man, man. I can make it work anywhere I can. Man, man. Even though the past for the American. Hi, um, this background look familiar to you? It's a great scene and world building, right? Only one problem. This scene is set in Uganda. However, I'm not in Uganda. I'm actually home in the Bahamas. I'm right across from my dad's house. And I wish when a young man would book a flight all the way to the Bahamas with your Joe Goldberg like a Cause what you don't see in the frame is the Royal Bahamas Defense Force, which is equivalent to the US Army, which you all spend more on than any other department in general. Stop typing, I see you, stop, hey, stop that, bad. I know you probably already thinking like, foreign studios shoot scenes in different locations all the time. And that is emphatically true, yes, indeed. Um, studios would act like they're in New York when really they're in Atlanta. But there's something sinister with lumping Swats of black countries together. I mean, I could literally see the thought process required to come to this conclusion. Let's save a book or two and just shoot Uganda in Bahamas. Africa and the Caribbean look all about the same anyway. There are red blacks there, so we don't even have the shit. I mean, we don't even have to hire none. My big man, them, woman, them, and my big non binary folk, them, listen. This is but one of the many different issues that I hold with the James Bond franchise. But before I get into that, I gotta get some things off my chest like breast reduction. I have some big news for you, you know, but let me explain to you why, despite this being great news for you and I, it's also very terrifying news. Near the year's end, I got into some rooms that I honestly don't feel like I belonged in. And that feeling of fraudulence, the idea that I'm an imposter, it's a neurosis that I have to unpack in a later video altogether. Because here I was, rubbing shoulders with people I literally look up to. No longer were they these unobtainable people. They were my peers. And accompanying this immense sense of joy like a melody to a chord was this profound sense of dread deep within my gourd. It was like the career fair all over again. I wanted to put on my proverbial suit and my best white voice and, you know, work the room. But my felt faker than a Trump dollar bill. And it didn't take long to dawn on me that I wasn't here because of who I'm not. I'm here because of who I am. I'm here because of the Caribbean candor that borderlines on indulgent. So I discarded my garments and stood stark naked in this room as the foreign you've come to know and hopefully not hate. This is still a metaphor, by the way. D please, I was not naked. And I'm sure many were turned off immediately. But some, just a few people weren't. And one of those persons was Dirty Dan. I, I mean, Dave. And watch this. I had absolutely no idea that this conversation between Dave and I would have an indelible effect on not only my career, but my life. Yet even here, that very dread that I thought I shook off returned like a thief in the night to steal the murk that I was supposed to feel in this very moment. Because if you haven't noticed, I don't do sponsorships. Sure, I've attested to my barber's adaptability at leaving my lineup straight in at six o'clock, but I've purposefully declined sponsorships for one reason in particular. My mission is to combat the stigmas, the negative and harmful stigmas associated with the Caribbean. And in pursuit of that, I am often on the offensive end of some very problematic depictions of Caribbean culture. So I need the freedom to express myself in a way that is authentic and aligns with the values of this community, which directly objects many sponsorships that would rather me talk about, you know, less problematic things. Just make some jokes in your high-pitched Caribbean accent, please. N none of that SJW. 
And all of these things make content creation very difficult at times. In fact, sometimes unsustainable. Sure, our revenue is great, but it could also be very volatile. And what about the times when you make a video that might not be suitable for adverts? Between you and me, listen, I sometimes buckle under the gravity of these fears. I've seen channels literally obliterated by demonetization. And I think to myself, what is stopping that reality from being mine? What if my channel gets to a point where it's totally unsustainable? What if I'm doomed to the 9 to 5 that my parents would love for me to be in and, you know, not be a disappointment, which is anything but a lawyer, doctor, or an engineer? And anything else to a Caribbean parent is just a disappointment. These are fears that I, as well as many other creators, face on a daily basis. We ruminate over the ruin of our channels and our livelihood. Which is why I'm delighted to disclose that this video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream on Nebula. I wouldn't put nothing in front of your beautiful face and Lord, you're sexy this morning, you know. You're nice like chicken and rice, my God. Anyway, I wouldn't put nothing in front of your beautiful face if I didn't believe in it and if I didn't use it myself. And for the next three days, this for y'all early birds that has come early to the videos, for the next three days, you could get 42% off of this bundle by signing up for the link in the description right now. Gain exclusive, odd free access to creators like me, FD, Cat Block Lord, the list goes on. Thousands, not hundreds, thousands of videos that won't make your brain rot like TikTok as well as exclusives from us that can't be on YouTube. Forget Netflix and Hulu, listen, my big man, them, my big woman, them, my big non-binary folk, them. This is the best bundle in streaming. Nebula is the Calvary in my fight against skullduggery. The platform made by us for you. And we've teamed up with Curiosity Stream to bring you a deal that you would be damned to dismiss. This is a close coterie of passionate creatives that created a platform by us, for us, and you, with no Viagra pill ads or nothing like that, you ain't getting none of that. You could gain access to this incredible platform as well as simultaneously supporting marginalized creators and the creators that you already love. And that's more than we can say for Dr. No, the first movie in this Bond franchise. Did you know that Bond was born in Jamaica? Because he wasn't, you know, the, the, the novel was just written in Jamaica by Ian Fleming. And even Ian himself said that Dr. No, the first iteration in these Bond franchise, was hot garbage. Like, I talking hot dog water, booty in a brown paper bag, garbage. Now, my first disclaimer is that I understand that this is a film of its time. Being released in the early 60s, I expect it to age like a Karen. And if you love the film already, I have great news for you. I love the Cosby show too. And after hearing the allegations against Cosby, the new OJ, I ain't gonna lie, I was still laughing at him in his ugly sweaters. You can still enjoy problematic media. There's not much media that isn't problematic at a certain point in time because we're constantly evolving. You can enjoy it still, as long as you understand the caveats associated with it. That you understand that it's not the gospel. And second disclaimer, you all set who using WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and all that to send skullduggery about Let's Go Brandon and all of that You need to log off now. Log off. Get off your computer. Because you're taking up valuable bandwidth. You know how long it took me to pirate, I mean, how long it took me to rent these James Bond franchise movies? From the onset. We are greeted by these colorful silhouettes of, I assume, Caribbean bodies? Shaking and gyrating to the most gentrified polyrhythms, African polyrhythms played upon Congos. This sets up the skullduggery that will ensue shortly thereafter. Tree blind, my stair they go. Jesus, take the wheel. Take the damn wheel and drive me to the pearly gates, by God. Lay on the horn like a husky that been in the car for too long. And wait till your pa come out so I can ask him personally, what in the bumba ross rotted clod is this? This team sound like the director asked for the composer to make something that sound like Arthur. The Arthur theme song by, by Marley and them. He wanted it to sound like that, but instead of hi-hat, he say odd more Chet Hanks. Booyaka, booyaka. This original piece would be the barking for a ludicrous display of negrosity. Yes, you must. Thank you. Movie ain't even five minutes in. 
And you already affirming negative stereotypes about black Caribbean people being criminals? And to top it off, they finished this scene. <laughs> Listen, I've heard some deplorable, deplorable Caribbean Jafakin Jif accents, right? But this one right here takes the cake. Hurry, man, hurry. Lord, if this ain't the jerk chicken from your Caribbean themed office party. Terrence Young directed this, right? Terrence Young, you need to direct your Oh, my bad. Rest up, rest in peace, rude boy. But damn, you in Jamaica, right? Why you just didn't put one shearer inside a yard man hon and, and tell him say the line for you? Terrence Young gone all the way out of his way. Like this is his way right here. My boy took the scenic route, a detour around his way to bring a non-Caribbean black man to say this line in a country, a Caribbean country. With Caribbean black men! I must see need to change the subtitles to a different language altogether because maybe it might make sense in French. Because a damn sure that you won't, I mean, a damn sure don't make sense in English. Someone send help. I can't stop breaking into song. I feel like I on the set of glee. Some may say that this is pedantic. And it is. All analysis is over analysis and it's absolutely warranted. So I'm a reasonable man. Get off my case. Get off. I Stop, man. Stop. Jesus, I can't stop singing. What's wrong with me? If people could break down Harry Potter, make all kind of fan fiction about Hermione, Juice, and Dobby, and still lord it, even though Rowling out here turfing up the damn place, then I could dissect the subtle racism and harmful stereotypes that exist in these Bond films. So do not rump with me today. It Sean Connery stars as James Bond. And if I were to take on the abundance of atrocities against minorities in the Bond franchise, I would be driven to drink. Luckily, Philosophy Tube has an entire podcast dedicated to killing Bond that I wish I knew about before I watched all of these Bond films. But Bond gone to battle, oh yeah, spoilers by the way. I don't, I didn't know I needed to go and give spoilers for a movie that's already spoiled, but spoiler warning, Bond gone to battle Spectre which is this voracious and criminal terrorist organization. Uh, so the far right. He's sent to Jamaica where the MI6 operative was killed by the three blind mice. And Bond tried to figure out what's going on inside this foreign land, you know what I'm saying? But he, he, he has some trouble. So he enlists the help of some locals. And let me tell you something. My patience must be stronger than an Apple password because there's absolutely no reason why a Caribbean person would watch this and not tip over the nearest pop-up truck. My big man, them woman, them and non-binary folk, them. Uh, I just had to give you all another greeting because this film gave me dementia. The first black woman we see in this film is balancing a basket on her head top like the National Geographic documentaries. Where do I find She had one purpose, I guess two, to depict black women like that for the first part. So I mean, God forbid that this is the first black woman that you see in the movie. Anyway, but 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 her real purpose was to usher Bond to another Caribbean black person. At first, I thought that this man was a black Jamaican man because you know they're in Jamaica. Come to find out, he's not Jamaican at all. He's actually Kamani. And the only reason why I could imagine that they would make this man. Kamani, rather than Jamaica, you know, the country that, you know, they're in right now, is because the actor that plays this man, John Kitzmiller, Kit Killmonger, or something like that, right? The man is not Caribbean at all. He is from Michigan. I mean, I don't expect anything more for directors to cast black people monolithically. You know, once you're black, you could just speak any type of dialect, any type of accent. You could represent any type of experience as long as you're black. You could, you could represent any other black experience so long as you're black. That's, you know, that comes part and parcel with the, with the melanin. But I do not understand Terrence Young. Why, make it, why are you making it so hard for yourself? Why you just didn't go and check and see if there was any Jamaican actors there that you could literally just hire to represent this role authentically and you know he wouldn't be butchering the culture that they're representing. I mean mind you know, I do appreciate when an actor can immerse themselves in a particular culture and represent it accurately with full fidelity. I mean you've seen Sidney Poitier, the late Sidney Poitier, the late and great Sidney Poitier in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? But you never knew that he was Bahamian. That's because he's just an excellent actor. Of course, actors can play different nationalities than they are in their real life. That's called good acting. It's when, it's when an actor, more so a casting director or director in general, has an actor that 
bastardizes that culture that they're supposed to be emulating. Especially when you have a minority culture like Caribbean culture. That's when you get the skullduggery. That's when you get white fellas with them dumb thick bodies screaming wagwan in a tongue like DJ Khaled. Anyway, like I was saying, Quarrel, played by Kitz Miller, is a bigger Jafakin than Snow. At least Snow sound like he could be one of them white fellas from Toronto that been around all kind of yardies in them. He could sound like that, but but <laughs> Quarrel? Coral sound like he's straight out of a Melvin Van Peebles film. This man is toggled between an American and Jafakin accent like I is toggled between YouTube and Reddit. That there's the Caribbean. That's where. Station. It's crazy. It's like they didn't even care. It's like Terrence Young was just like, you know, I think that mon is the only word that Caribbean people say that has an accent. Everything else is exactly the same as it sounds as an African-American could say. And Quarrel is probably one of the most underdeveloped supporting roles that I have ever seen in a film. If he was a support beam, he wouldn't be worthy of bolstering anything from a gust of wind, from a wave, from the queen. Quarrel exists solemnly to hold Bond's hand into the next sexual escapade or lead Bond to the next intrepid incident where he miraculously marshes up effortlessly the villain without as much as breaking a sweat in the Caribbean. Where Bond gets the glory kills and rapacious rendezvous with women thinner than white people lips, Quarrel does exactly as his name would suggest. Quarrels! Now how's about? Ain't no use you struggling. No epic fights with fancy gadgets or anything like that. No technical takedowns that end up in dramatic casualty. Ah, oh, Jesus Lord, I just hit the light, man. Hey, I hope you all enjoying this video because I am physically ailing from it. Not only from hitting my hand, but just talking about this in general. But all Coral doing is grabbing up women from the behind at the behest of Bond. Belongs to a Chinese. Get her, Quarrel. And the camera. Even it misses. You're hurting. It's very much giving Jeffrey. It's giving the help. Not to mention how truculent Quarrel comes off from manhandling this woman. This is to lend evidence to the black beast stigma that was all the rage since, well, colonialism. And if the black beast stigma wasn't apparent from Quarrel's actions, the journalist is used as a vehicle to reify this stigma. Tell this ape to let me go. <laughs> They just go and mask off with it. You know, it's mask off, you know what I'm saying? What is most abhorrent and repugnant about this is that they use a woman of color to articulate racist rhetoric. Why this is so powerful is because of the stigma that white supremacy has relied upon in regards to protecting white women from rapacious and savage black men. Think back to a movie that I never grow tired of referencing just as a perfect example of how strong anti-black rhetoric and propaganda was. But think back to Birth of a Nation, where they literally framed black men as rapists. So black men have been characterized as these black beasts with voracious appetites for sex. Unconsensual ones at that. And this is only reified in this film, especially when the journalist smashes a bulb on Quarrel's face. And he has no reaction, almost as if he's impervious to it. He's impervious to pain. It's the same type of issue that you have where now white cops or law enforcement or just about anybody pretty much ignores black pain from the women to the men especially which is why you can even adultify if that's okay adultification if that's what you could adultify someone a minor a black boy like tamir rice <laughs> Furthermore, they're really trying to drive home this thuggish, savage, truculent, black stereotype by Coral asking if he could break her arm. We don't get nothing out of this gal. You want for me to break her arm? All of this adduces evidence to this stigma in particular that has plagued black men for, for all of history, really. In fact, these films aren't very far apart. So Dr. No wouldn't even really be novel in its bigotry. Thus, to not only use a woman to articulate this very bigoted rhetoric, 
but a woman of color is in particularly repugnant as it would have been elsewise. This was the first woman of color to have a prominent speaking role in the film. And this is what her speech is used for, almost to really drive home the fact that black men are desirable in this film, maybe in general. I mean, think about if you look at the contrast between Bond and his, albeit non-consensually and very creepy sexual escapades, Quarrel is sexless. Quarrel doesn't have any love interests. Quarrel just goes about quarreling. Yet another interesting part about the woman to me is that she's framed as an Asian woman. But if you look at her IMDb page, she's actually of Jamaican heritage, which blows my mind like Ronald Reagan's wife. How you have a whole opportunity to lend authenticity to your film by using local talent and you just fumble it like Super Bowl last throw, fumble the wipe. It's like this film was made to piss me off. <laughs> then they had the nerve to make a band with an Asian man being the front man singing, I have absolutely no idea what this song is. I don't know. Make it make sense. Ignore the part where the Asian man mouth ain't even open up, but you hear singing. Cause my favorite part is that you have all of the white fellas them jumping up and dancing, having a gay old time like Fred Flintstone, right? Then all of a sudden, boom, you have a black fella here seizing up himself looking like he just had a cyanide pit. It's like every effort at blackness is just to depict it as some form of tribal, animalistic, non-human characterizations, especially when contrasted to Bond's cavalier, smooth and suave behavior. It's subtle, for sure, and, and that's the point. And this film extends its othering of blackness to more minorities. I don't want to focus too much on anything but Caribbean, because like I said, it's, it's very difficult. I'll be here all day. But I want to talk in particular about one character, because this really sat with me. This really resonated with me, I ain't gonna lie. The character in question is Miss Taro. It's an Asian woman who was fawning over Bond like Chip Skylark is fawned over by any other woman. Hello? Oh, Mr. Bond. These rusty old ma I could see these old fellas, these old white rusty fellas just at their typewriter writing women. You know, just writing them very wrongly, by the way. I'm positive very wrongly would you have a sample size of women from all of these different ethnicities just fallen, you know, tripping over themselves to go and just throw themselves at bond. This average British white man in a foreign country. And, oh Lord, my God, I need some tea. Why they had to lift up a flock like that? Like she wanted them dancers that would be kicking their leg and thing. You know what I'm talking about? Lifting up their skirt and kicking their leg. Why they do why, why they do it like that? It became quickly apparent that Miss Taro was fulfilling the role, if there was a quota for it, of the geisha, which reports this trope that Asian women in particular are hyper-feminine, also showing that they have absolutely no autonomy when it comes to bond. You know, James walks through the door and sexually assaults your bond. I'll just go and put some clothes on. I don't go to any trouble. For contrast, however, we have the first woman that shows a bit of resistance, not too much, you know, not too much, but a bit of resistance to Bond's, I don't know, that, that gaze that Sean Connery has. Ooh, it just does something to you. And this resistance renders her worthy and desirable. Honey Rider, she don't need Bond. She don't need no man. She's formidable in her own right, which is all to uphold this Aryan argument of supremacy. Honey Ryder, when she saw James Bond, you know, it was, it was all right, you know, everything was cool. But, but, but when she saw a quarrel dog out there running towards them, oh, no, 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 no. Hundred juk, thousand star. Hey, come and take a look. That's all right, he's with me. Captain, what do you think of that? And Bond said, no, honey. That's my African-American. African I mean, Caribbean man played by African-American. Hmm, shaken, stirred. It's a very quick and subtle juxtaposition, but it reveals a lot. She immediately feels unsafe and threatened by the mere presence of Quarrel, as the savage black man's stigma and stereotype would suggest. So they're on this island, right? And they finally confront Dr. No. And without spoiling too much, we finally get to the climax, the payoff that we've been waiting for for so long. This dinner scene where Dr. No reveals his intentions with the island and 
Honestly, it is by far, to me, one of the most intriguing and revealing parts of this film. You'll find this is a very small and naked little island. An expendable little island, Mr. Bond. When my mission here in Crab Key is accomplished, I destroy it and move on. This scene is as beautiful as it is dangerous, especially when you think of the fact that this was written from a Eurocentric standpoint. The fact that they're making this imperial commentary is easily one of the highlights of this film for me. It's, it's just too palpably good to pass up. Dr. No is framed as this Asian imperial crime lord that is orchestrating this campaign of world domination or something like that, I don't know. And he reveals that after he's done with this Caribbean island, he's just going to discard the Caribbean island and move on to another one. Why this is so powerful is because of how canny of a resemblance it bears to the anti-Chinese propaganda that came out of the West. Claims that China is constructing projects and gifting money and things like that to these African and Caribbean countries in order to expand their influence, which they're definitely doing. China donates all kind of things to the Caribbean and Africa, just like the Americans do. Only difference is when the Americans do it, it's charitable. But when the Chinese do it, it's viewed as vying for hegemony. This, this red scare or yellow fever, or whatever you want to call it. It's just a subtle difference. Actually, it's not subtle at all. It's full of mask off, you know, the difference between how it's framed when China does it versus America does it. And the fact that Dr. No is used as a vehicle to articulate this imperialist China perspective. <laughs> I mean, to the untrained eye, they probably, you know, you probably wouldn't notice how sinister and how pernicious it is. But when you study political science for upwards of almost seven years, I mean, this is, this is very interesting. Dr. No is depicted as this insouciant imperialist. Whereas James Bond, the same sexist, rapacious, and racist character, is shown to be this altruistic man all of a sudden. That's just so bent up and down bad about the fact that Coral was killed, and this is the first time we're actually hearing about this in the entirety of the film. I prefer the revenge department. Of course, my first job would be finding the man who killed Strangways and Quarrel. Dr. No sets the tone for what's to come, and was a success by any standards of today, with an enduring fandom that clamors and probably will fill these comments with all kind of unkind things to say about my gap. But in comparison to this next Bond film that references the Caribbean, I don't think it could hold a candle. <laughs> Live and let die. This, in my opinion, is the absolute worst Bond film that references the Caribbean. We have Roger Moore playing Bond, who is the J. Cole to Kendrick Lamar, the big boy to Andre T. Townsend, the placido flicking Domingo to Pavarotti. He doesn't have the gravitas or charm that Connery has, so he just comes off as that creepy middle-aged white man that had an existential crisis in the States, so he flew to a foreign country to go on vacation, which loosely translates to harassing local galdem. He's investigating the murders of M16 agents, yet again, that's very similar to uh, Dr. No. I, I'm beginning to think that these MI6 agents should, you know, get in a different vocation. And all of a sudden, he becomes a target as well. Who would have thunk? They're on this fictional Caribbean island called San Monique. And I kid you not, this is going to be the shortest section of this entire video because I just can't take it, my heart. I can't take it. Four minutes in. The credits ain't even finished rolling yet. We have a full-blown voodoo ritual going on. And to make matters worse, they are talking a white man that, I don't know, tied to a stake with a snake? to say that these voodoo practices don't exist. Although I have not seen a snake um, being held and used as a weapon against a white man, but 
You, you've seen my video on Obey, right? This cartoonish travesty and parody of this religion is absolutely abysmal. Why the hell are they shoving the snake in this man's face? They trying their hardest. They trying their endeavor best to depict Caribbean people as these superstitious and savage people. Then they go on, on to show Baron Samidi about 30 minutes later. Yes, they're 30 minutes later and they're still on this voodoo stereotype of the Caribbean. <laughs> and it's pretty much the only depiction of Caribbean people in this film. Like 30 minutes in and we haven't seen a regular schmegular Caribbean man walking down to the store or you know taking his dog to pee or something like that. We ain't seen none of that. It's an absolute erasure of any type of Caribbean person other than voodoo priestess and priests until you know we finally we finally get a glimpse of a caribbean man that isn't adorned in gaudy you know caricature of makeup that represent voodoo and uh, what do you think this person is characterized as what do you think this normal caribbean person is characterized as over here bring your man over here just 20 dollars have a day you got warm lady we got cold beer over here man you want to catch a big fish there it's only two pounds over here morning yes yes another offering of the lazy black man stereotype that you know now extends to caribbean people as well i just can't i i, I literally can't you know if 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 we were to put this on a tail this would be f tail anything lower than that you can put f tail f of anyway and if they ain't getting f because of you know the depiction of caribbean people you could definitely give it f for the time when roger moore playing bond literally tricked a tarot card reader out of her virginity but you know i ain't got no energy for that i have absolutely none it's hot now the next substantial setting of the caribbean in a bond film is casino royale and this film was released in 2006 so a great gamut of time divides these two bond films set in the caribbean it's a whole nother director a whole nother location a whole nother bond it's intended to be a reset of the series. So hopefully, you know, time has passed, people have matured, you know, all kind of civil rights, uh, you know, milestones have been met. Maybe that means that, you know, Caribbean depictions and black minority depictions in general will probably be better, right? Right? Daniel Craig is the new Bond. With his subtle baguette complexion and his, you know, somewhat dad bod, you know, like just a kind of buff dad bod if that was a genre. You know, he, he ain't daddy, he's more zaddy, like, you know, because he, he got a little bit of a gut, but he's been working out, but he's still not on the same level as a Channing Tatum or a Taylor Lautner. Immediately, we're ferried to Uganda, where there is a literal camp of black militia, which transitions to a pit of black people watching, and I assume betting, on a snake fighting a mongoose? Is that a mongoose? I'm not Teazu, I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> Holster the bloody weapon, Carter. I need him alive. But I guess, you know, all the black people in Uganda are, are just Michael Vicks. But instead of dogs, you know, they, they deal with mongoose and, and snakes. Anyway, the undercover agent is made by the perp. And then there's this chase scene. But Bond is like... You don't know what you're doing, rookie. Let me show you how we get down in the plus four four. So Hitler's wet dream is chasing down this black villain, I assume. I assume he's a villain. And keeping in mind, we're in Uganda now. But suddenly, they hop a fence, and they're in my dad's backyard. Imagine little Ashi chubby me with shorts so tight that you could see the brand of pen that I have in my pocket. Watching this film and the only thing running in my mind is who let you on my beach? Even though it wasn't my beach, but I go to that beach. I don't remember you being there. How the hell you get there? I used to play in that abandoned hotel. I, I mean, they just, I guess they just moved in and out overnight. And I get it, you know, they're trying to be efficient. They're trying to shoot as many scenes as they can in the same place. But this is my main gripe with this situation, right? The movie ends up going to the Bahamas. So why you just didn't start the damn movie there? Why you get Uganda them involved in it? 
I mean, there was barely a Ugandan scene anyway. I can imagine them poor Ugandans watching this film, poor knuckles in them, and look and say, what did we do to deserve this? Because the film very quickly transitions to the Bahamas, and that's actually where more skullduggery ensues. If you thought you thought it couldn't get worse, <laughs> um, Bond Casino Royale was like, hey, hold my bear, hold my Bahama mama, hold my sky juice. So they driving down this strip, right? This strip that I drive down pretty much every morning. And good old Danny Craig gets to the Ocean Club. So the Ocean Club is this popular resort that's located on Paradise Island, which is an island that is connected to the mainland, which is New Providence where the capital Nassau is. So as you can imagine, it's not very rare for a Bahamian to be over in, in this resort. You know, we, we, could, we could go there. But I get to the scene, right? And, and you know, it's the beginnings of the scene. And I, I just saw Bahamians working there. You know, Bahamians in uniform in, in the service industry working there. Bond tosses his keys day, very sir. casually to the valet. To which the valet takes no you know offense to it, but watch what happens here. Hello? Are you going to take this or make me wait? Certainly, sir. Sorry, sir. The man mistake born for a valet, right? And Danny boy runs so hot that he back up the boy car into another car like a bumper in the dance hall. What's wrong with being a valet, Bond? Nothing was wrong with it when you assumed the Bahamian was. And as the scene progressed, I noticed something rather strange. I saw maids that were black. I saw chip dealers in the casino that were black. I saw valets that were black. But I, yet again, just like the film before, I did not see one regular black Bahamian person just existing. The only existence of black Bahamians in the Bahamas was service. How do you how do you sleep at night after erasing an entire class of people in their country and depicting them only as service workers? Otherwise, you don't exist in your own. <laughs> Wait, where are my teeth? I've never seen more white people inside the Bahamas since 1973, which is when, you know, it was a colony. And of course, I, I didn't see that personally because I'm only 26. So I saw it inside the black and white history books. And I still didn't see that many white people there. You mean to tell me you couldn't joke one regular schmegular Bahamian person in there? Just one. Just, just one fella right there just chilling with some, with some frat boy shorts on, some polo shorts on, and a polo shirt, and a little hat. Why you couldn't do that? We got people there. I've been to Ocean Club before. I sit up in there and ate their awful food that, that is devoid of anything of, of seasoning. And the remainder of this film is pretty much in this casino. And I bore witness to the absolute erasure of any black Bahamian other than a service worker. So from the 60s to the 70s, and then a very precipitous jump to the 2000s, the early 2000s. Three different directors, three different bonds, Three different Caribbean islands. Nothing, nothing at all changed. Some may argue that it actually got worse with the myriad of misogynist vignettes that are only rivaled by racist picaresque moments where they go full mask off and reveal the character, the true character of these characters that indirectly reveal the character of these directors and maybe even Hollywood in general. It's very telling how these biases, implicit or explicit, still endure to this very day. But who is it really exposing? The directors and the production houses that let this film go to print? Or the audience and fandoms of these films that not only laud them with their attention, but their actual dollars, demanding more with every iteration of Bond? People are aware of how vile this villain, I, I mean, this hero can be. But he's constantly given the benefit of the doubt because he's so suave, he's so smooth. How can you not like him? He's a cultural icon with sayings that have set the standard for action and espionage. He's the poster child for this genre of film when he could be the poster child for so many different things. At least be tongue in cheek. 
I mean, I would have probably forgiven it if the last film in this entire, you know, franchise where he died. Oh, oops. I'm sorry. I just spoiled it, but I saved you. You're welcome. If they had probably taken a more satirical approach, I could have forgiven some of these things. Potentially, probably not. But at least people would have a chance to understand how it truly should be received. This cartoonish depiction of white masculinity, misogyny, and racism. And if you want to see how real spies get done, then you have to watch Spies of War or Spy in Game on Curiosity Stream. You just have to. Use this link in the description to get an accurate rundown of spies from the Cold War and even more. And at the risk of sounding redundant, 42% off. Had I three ears out here, D? What you still doing looking at me? I can't be that pretty. Touch up that link right now. If that link don't get touched right now, 